Hello, my dear listeners. This is Jörg Lissmann once again from Jogler 66 Hour of the Truth with a new video. And this is not just a simple new video. This one is going about reading a book. When I was listening again to Tom Fress reading Romanism at the Reformation one of these days when I was in the gym, he was speaking about uh, a quote that was taken from a book called History of the Inquisition from an author uh, called Limburge. And uh, I was very much impressed by what Limburge wrote and I thought maybe it is possible to get that book and see if people are interested in listening and learning what Limburge wrote in this book. So I looked that book up and I saw that that was published in 1731 and then I learned that Philip van Limborch, uh, who lived in the Netherlands, in the Low Countries, as you can see on my Wikipedia page here, um, that he was born in 1633 and lived until the April 30th in 1712. He was a Dutch remonstrant theologian who was born at Amsterdam and his father was a lawyer. He received his education at Utrecht, at Leiden, and also in the Utrecht University, where later on where he studied, he was a friend of John Locke. And the letter concerning toleration was likely addressed to and first published Philip from Limburg. He died at Amsterdam on 30th of April 1712. Now they mention here which are his works, and in the second part you can see, see here um, what is this work of him? That is Historia Inquisitionis, which appeared in 1692 in four books prefixed to the Liber Cententarium Inquisitionis Tolosanae, which he wrote between 1308 and 1323. So the Historia Inquisitionis is in English the history of the Inquisition. He wrote this book in 1692, but as we can read, uh, and I will read this here, a translation of the Historia Inquisitionis by Samuel Chandler, with a large introduction concerning the rise and progress of persecution and the real pretended cause of it, prefixed, appeared in 1781, uh, 1731. Sorry. Like I told you, the year that I knew that book was first published. Okay. So that means that Philip van Limborch wrote this book, 1692, which is an interesting date, because we know that the Edict of Nantes was revoked in France in 1685 by Louis the Fourteenth because of the interference of his confessor. Père de la Chaise. And the revocation of the Edict of Nantes led to again the persecution of the French Huguenots, a Protestant people within France. And 400,000 of those Huguenots in the following years when the persecution started again fled from France for before the, uh, before the uh, persecution actually and partly of course also because of the Inquisition. And where did they go to? They, get, they did go to the neighboring countries, which is not only Germany, but also Netherlands, what we call today Netherlands. The Low Countries, Flanders, as it was named at that time. And from there, of course, many sailed ship to the New World, the United States of America. Because you have in the United States of America many people who have Huguenot roots, like the author Tapasorsi, of which I read and discussed the book Rulers of Evil on my channel, as you probably remember. So, I think reading this book, The History of Inquisition, can be very interesting. And I just want to introduce to you next Philip from Limborch, what I just talked about, the author of the book, who published this in 1692, about the, uh, about the person who translated this book doesn't say this here in Wikipedia that he translated this book, but that is him, Samuel Chandler. He was born at Hungerford in Berkshire and um, was sent to stool at Gloucester, where he began a friendship with Bishop Butler. Then afterwards he studied at Leiden, 
So you see that he studied at Leiden, which we just learned, Philip from Limborch. He received his education in Utrecht and Leiden. So I do not think that it is presumptuous to say that these people probably have met. Of course, Samuel Chandler was much younger because he was born in 1693 and lived to 1766. So this is means that he, uh, Samuel Chandler, came to life one year after uh, Limborch wrote this book. But, uh, you know, Limborch lived until 1712, so uh, probably they haven't met. But anyway, uh, he also, Samuel Chandler, studied at Leiden, so he probably got to know his work from that time. Was he a real Bible-believing Christian? Well, in a special sense of way, he received high preferment uh, of the Church of England. And then, of course, he was a Presbyterian minister. He was moderately Calvinistic in his views and leaned towards Ar Arianism. Well, Arianism, of course, is uh, a man-centered gospel, and uh, we all know that that is not biblical, but that doesn't mean that this man cannot translate a book. <coughs> anyway, which he did. That's why I'm doing this video. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have anything to say about it. So, we come to the book, The History of the Inquisition, written by Limborch. And uh, this is a book of 746 pages. So it's going to take quite a little bit more than this one video to get through the book. And I only pre-read the first 20 pages or something, 30 pages, 35 pages. And then I thought whether I'm going to read it for myself or I'm going to read it for my public. This is not a book that I'm going to read twice or even three times before going to a recording. Because simply I just do not have the time. But I want to get this work out. So I decided to record this. And as you can probably see already here, it is written in an English that is not that common for the day of 2017. It is in Old English letters, as you can see. Uh, between the F and the S there is here and there just a little difference. And, of course, you know that I am not a native English speaker, so for me it is probably even a little bit more difficult than for a lot of you. But I try not to make too many mistakes and try to use my emphasis, uh, my, my emphasis on, and on the pronunciation, on the, right, on the words rightfully and correctly, that you will enjoy the reading uh, when you listen to what I am reading here to you. I don't know if I read all the introduction and prefaces before we go into that. Let's see how that goes, because sometimes it's really quite lengthy and not that much interesting. But I want to start here with the foreword from the author, from the uh, from the translator, um, which is actually addressed by the uh, by the author. So this is um, this is from the author himself because he says this is to the Queen Regent. Now the Queen Regent at the time of the writing of this book was Queen Mary II, who was uh, the wife of William of Orange, the Dutch Prince of Orange that was invited to come to England to take the throne after the glorious revolution that threw out the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was James II before, who was a Catholic. And they wanted again a Protestant on the throne in England. And therefore they got William of Orange, and his wife was Queen Mary II. And to her, as you can see, to the Queen Regent, this book was dedicated. Because Queen Mary, there is quite a long story behind that, but that you can read for yourself. She was not that fond of the chair of reigning the country. She led it to her husband, even though she was the bloodline that actually deserved to reign England, not her husband, who came from Netherlands, yeah, who came from the Dutch countries. But she was actually the bloodline that should have reigned in that time. So this is why Limborch, the author, 
who published this book in 1692, dedicated this preface to the Queen Regent, Mary II, wife of William of Orange. Okay. It is almost 40 years later that this book got translated. At that time, England was reigned by George II. So, without any further ado, I'm going to read to you to the Queen Regent from the History of Inquisition from Limburg. Madam, I should never have entertained the least thought of, prevent of presenting to Your Majesty the history of the Inquisition, but that it afforded me an opportunity of expressing my sincere joy in that which is the common happiness of these nations. Your Majesty's just abhorrence of all the frauds and cruelties authorized and practiced by that infamous tribu tribunal, and your generous concern for the civil and religious liberties of mankind. We have to understand here, when he speaks about of all the frauds and cruelties authorized and practiced by that infamous tribunal, he speaks of the Inquisition. The Inquisition that was officially set into gear in 1205 or 1203 until 1805. 600 years, more than 80 popes were reigning during the time of the Inquisition and do not think that the Inquisition today is extinct. It is not. It changed its name to the Congregation of the, uh, of the Faith, but it's still the Inquisition. But here the author addresses the Majesty by saying, Your Majesty's just abhor adhorrence of all the frauds and cruelties authorized and practiced by that infamous tribunal, meaning the Inquisition, and your generous concern for the civil and religious liberties of mankind. At that time, the kings and queens of the, of the United Kingdom of England really were Protestant and were concerned for the civil and religious liberties of mankind, at least that kind mankind that they were ruling above. Different, very much different from today. Because Queen Elizabeth II, who is reigning now in 2017 still, is not Protestant, except she says so, but she is not. They are all made Catholics in the meantime. They are all controlled by the Pope. At that time, the English monarchy still fought the Papists. But let's continue. In the earliest part of Your Majesty's life, when haughty honors and dignities must have appeared, when worldly, sorry, when worldly honors and dignities must have appeared with their greatest charms, you became an illustrious example of steadiness in the Protestant faith. Your resolution and piety triumphed over the strongest temptations. God revered your majesty as a blessing to the kingdoms now under your guardianship. As a reward of your constant adherence to truth and virtue, he hath made you the beloved queen of a free and powerful nation, whose loyalty is the effect of the most voluntarily choice, and flows from the two strongest motives in the world, the sense both of their interest and duty. Under the inspection of such a queen and mother, the British nation is in no pain for the royal progeny, but looks on them with pleasure as the source of their future happiness. Your Majesty's example will inspire them with zeal for the Protestant religion and your disinterested pursuit of truth form them into a love of liberty and teach them the true notion and proper use of it. It is Your Majesty's happy lot to live in an age and be the guardian of a nation in which the principles of all religion undergo the most exact and critical inquiry. And it is the peculiar glory of His Majesty's governments that all men are permitted to make such inquiries with safety. As superstition and error can never be effectually discovered and destroyed, nor religion maintain its native purity and dignity without the freest use of this invaluable privilege, 
it is impossible that the ends of government can require or that true religion can ever prescribe or justify the least invasion or abridgment of it. The revelation of the gospel, fixed immovable upon its own foundation of eternal truth, needs no methods of fraud and violence for its support. The great author of it appealed to the reason and conscience of men concerning the proofs of his divine mission and the nature of doctrines he taught. His apostles after him claimed no submission to their heavenly dictates without reasonable convictions founded in the demonstration of the spirit of truth. Happy had it been for the Christian church had the examples of the Son of God and his apostles been, in this respect as well as others, counted worthy of imitation. Happy had it been for the Christian Church had the examples of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and his apostles been, in this respect as well as others, counted worthy of imitation, if only we did what Jesus had done for us. If only we try to walk in his shoes, is what the author says here with other words. Happy had it been for the Christian church had the examples of the Son of God and his apostles been counted worthy of imitation. We should try to be like Christ, right? Christ was our example. Instead, quote unquote, Christianity fell more and more in apostasy, just like their examples the Jews, Israel, of the Old Testament. The author continues, Zeal for religion, both in princes and their subjects, is unquestionably, unquestionably a duty. But your majesty understands too well the great obligations to Christian charity and feels too great a pleasure in the exercise of this sacred virtue even to suffer your own zeal for religion to lead you into a cruel per persecuting warmth or to encourage others in the use of any methods for the defense of religion which are not only contrary to the genuine spirit and design of it but in the consequences destructive of the honor, success and even being of it. The succession of the illustrious house of Hanover to the throne of these kingdoms was a blessing of long expectations. The severities which were exercised upon Protestant dissenters in former reigns, upon the account of religion, made them cast their eyes upon that august family. From thence, madam, the afflicted hoped for relief. From thence the sufferers, for conscience' sake expected, under God, their salvation from the yoke of civil and ecclesiastical oppression. The happiness they both prayed and longed for, but were allowed to see only afar off we, their posterity, now enjoy. The all-merciful God hath abundantly answered their prayers and blessed us with the fruits of their expectations. When our liberties were unrighteously invaded and farther difficulties and sufferings were intended us, for our fidelity to the present royal family by an almost miraculous providence, his late majesty came into our relief and will ever be remembered with honor and, greatest and, 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 and uh, gratitude by us as our restorer and deliverer and as the common preserver of these nations from that destruction which so nearly threatened them. His present majesty, the inheritor of his royal father's virtues as well as kingdoms, will be reverenced for his impartial protection of all his subjects, for the wisdom of his counsels, the steadiness of his measures, and the glorious success which has crowned them in the settlement of the different and almost contrary interests of Europe and the preservation of the invaluable blessings of peace. Your Majesty will be admired for all those excellent endowments and admirable, ad, admirable virtues which render you the greatest ornament to public and private life. 
your regency of these kingdoms, conducted with such wisdom and goodness, shows you fit for the weight of government and the dignities of a crown. Your condescension and freedom in converting with persons of learning and virtue discovers your love of truth and your knowledge of the of to rec uh, and your knowledge to re how to reconcile the pleasures of conversation and friendship with the reverence due to majesty and power your love majesty your majesty your love to true religion and your impartiality in searching into the nature of it is the fullest evidence that your majesty's piety as well as the benevolence of your natural disposition must necessarily excite in your breast a just aversion to all methods of violence for the conviction and conversion of others. Now, I don't have to read this twice, but you have to understand very well what the author just said in this sentence. And I know I'm very much aware that this old English sometimes is very difficult to understand because I sometimes have difficulties to understand. <laughs> and of course that in that time it was probably common to write so sentences a little bit longer than we are used to today. Eh? Sometimes these sentences spend over a whole paragraph or span over a whole paragraph. But this sentence I want to read again because I think it is quite interesting to think about it for a little time. Your love from the Majesty, from the Queen of England, from Mary II, the wife of William of Orange, your love to true religion and your impartiality in searching into the nature of it, searching into the nature of true religion, is the fullest evidence that your majesty's piety as well as the benevolence of your natural disposition must necessarily excite in your breast a just aversion, a aversion to all methods of violence for the conviction and conversion of others. Meaning, the Roman Catholic Church says, convert or die, the Roman Catholic Church uses methods of violence for the conviction and conversion into their pagan belief system. And the author lords the majesty Queen Mary II that she has such a love for true religion and the searching into the nature of it and that is the Bible, that she stands 180 degrees opposed to that Roman Catholic teaching, that Roman Catholic conversion that is forced, among others, by the Inquisition, which this book will eventually start dealing about. We are just in the preface in a dedication to the Queen of England at that time. We are not even reading the preface. So please understand this, and I think this is sometimes very interesting to also read those parts of the book, to understand a little bit the history behind how this whole book came together and what the author was convicted of at that moment when he wrote this and published this book in 1692. Your affection to the Protestant religion and liberties in general, and your steady regard to the welfare of these kingdoms in particular, endear your majesty to the present generation and will be spoken of with pleasure by those to come. That God may long continue your majesty a blessing in every relation in which his providence hath fixed you, and after a full enjoyment of the highest honor of and prosperity which this world can afford you, receive you to the more substantial and durable blessings of the eternal world is the sincere and fervent prayer of, may it please your majesty, your majesty's most obedient 
most devoted and most humble servant. And that is signed here with Samuel Chandler, but means, of course, the author Limborch. Because this dedication was written in the original and then translated. So now we can go into the next part of the book, which is called the preface. I don't know if I go completely through that. You have to excuse me because you see the way that it is written and I read it already before. I'm not that sure that it is that important to read this preface, but on the other hand, you know, when you start a book of 750 pages, why leave out five, six pages of the preface? So let's just go on with it. I hope that you at least enjoy it a little bit, what I am reading here. So let's go into the preface of the book History of the Inquisition. The introduction to Mr. Limborch's history of the Inquisition hath run out to such a length that I have but little room for any preface. That history needs nothing that I can say to recommend it. When it first came over to England it was received with great approbation by many of the principal nobility and clergy. Mr. Luck, that incomparable judge and, uh, of men and books, gives it the biggest character and commands it for its method and perspic uh, perspicuity and the authorities by which it is so abundantly confirmed and pronounces it a work in its kind absolute perfect. He was particularly pleased that Mr. Limborch used the very words of the authors which he cites and, though this may be make the reading of the history tedious to some, yet it was necessary that the inquisitors might be convicted by the testimony of their own writers of those villainous frauds and cruelties with which they are charged. In a letter to Mr. Limborch himself, he tells him that he had so fully exposed their secret arts of wickedness and cruelty that, if they had any remains of humanity in them, they must be ashamed of that horrid tribunal in which everything that was just and righteous was so monstrously perverted, and that it was fit to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation that the meanest people might understand the anti-Christian practices of this execrable court. The papists were, to, were so apprehensive of the prejudices that might arise to their cause by the publication of this book that the cardinals, inquisitors, generals at Rome condemned it by an edict and forbade the reading it under the, uh, under the severest penalties. So, Reading this one sentence already convinced me that it is better to read the whole preface because it contains some very, very interesting and uh, important information about the whole book. <coughs> I'm going to repeat that last sentence again. In a letter to Mr. Limborch himself, he, Locke, tells him that he had so fully exposed their secret arts of wickedness and cruelty that if they had any remains of humanity in them, they must be ashamed of that horrid tribunal in which everything that was just and righteous was so monstrously perverted, and that it was fit to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation that the meanest people might understand the anti-Christian practices of that execrable court. That execrable court we are talking about here is the court of the Inquisition. That horrid tribunal what we are speaking about here is the tribunal of the Inquisition. And I don't want to go too much into commenting here. But you have to understand that when you were picked up by the Inquisition, you didn't even know what you were accused of. You didn't know your persecutors, you didn't know what you were accused of, and you couldn't do anything to save your life because you were tortured until you confessed what you didn't do. And after confession, you were put to death anyway. 
once in the hands of the Inquisition, you did not get out of it anymore. It's like in the Bible said, and these are the ports of hell, and he will not let no prisoner go free. The Inquisition killed millions and millions of millions of people all through the ages. And you couldn't get out of it. And then he says it was fit to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation. So this book is written in 1692 in Dutch, probably. It was translated in 1731 into English, and I'm going to ask you, do you know anybody who has known of this book, who has read this book, who has understood this book, or do you go to a church where they even speak about the Inquisition, where they even speak about the real Christian heritage, the real Christian history that is built on the tortures of the Inquisition that they had to suffer all through the ages? I don't think so. And because of, of little sentences like this, that these people find it so important and fit that books like this are being translated into the vulgar language of every nation, not only written in Dutch and translated into English, but also translated into Italian, into Spanish, into French, into German, into Chinese, into Japanese, into Russia. All over the world, books like this should be translated, should be read and should be taught in the churches, in the so-called churches in the so-called protestant churches. Where's that the case, I ask of you? Well, because I don't know many places where that is that case, that is one of the reasons why I'm sitting down here and reading this book for you, that you can follow it. I hope you like it. You know, this is a test reading. I'm going to tell you that, f quite frankly, this is a test reading. If you don't like me reading this book, if you say, oh, I don't need that, I don't care, well, then I won't do it. I will do it for myself. I won't, do go, uh, I won't go through all that work, making a video of it like I do now, and commenting here and there, and try to read this old English, English, which I often have hard problems to understand, and, of course, you know, with the letters here and there, I even make mistakes. This is very hard for me, and I don't do that for my pleasure. No, I do that because the Holy Ghost leads me to do that, and because I think it is necessary, and because I think it is necessary for every person who calls himself a Protestant to first read the Bible, to second read Romanism and the Reformation, where this book was mentioned, and probably on the third place to read the history of the Inquisition, to understand what really happens to people who really follow Christ in this world. Because they are persecuted. They were persecuted from the moment on that Jesus was on, died on the cross. He was the first persecuted Christian. The first Christian who died was Jesus Christ. And from then on, you remember when you read through the book of the Apostles, Acts, you know, that Paul was a persecutor of the Christians, right? That was right after the crucifixion time. And before that, we had, of course, the persecution of the Jews and the persecution of Israel. Real Bible-believing people always were persecuted, always were inquisitioned. And that's why I think it is not only interesting, it is important to learn of the Inquisition, to learn of the history of the Inquisition. And I hope that you will embrace videos like this that be, are being brought to you to teach you, to tell you things that you otherwise would probably never have learned of. 
and you know you don't even need to watch the video because the only thing that you will see in the videos are the pages that I'm reading. So you can even use this as an mp3. Listen to it while you're in the gym, as I did when I was in the gym with Romanism and the Reformation. When you're driving your car, when you're in the train, when you're on the plane, when you're on the beach, when you're on a walk, wherever you are and you have the possibility to listen to an mp3 today with modern phones, it's all no problem anymore. You can do that. Take it anywhere. Listen to it. Learn of it. Read the book for yourself. If I can get a few people just to get the book, download it from the internet, because I will provide the download link, of course, of this book in the video, when I can get a few people to download it for themselves and read it for themselves and spread this book about, well, then my message has at least reached something. It was fit to be translated into the vulgar language of every nation that the meanest people might understand the anti-Christian practices of this execrable court, the Inquisition court. The Papists were so apprehensive of the prejudices that might arise to their cause by the publication of this book that the Cardinals, the Inquisitors General at Rome, condemned it by an edict and forbade the reading of it under the severest penalties exactly like they forbade the reading of the Bible, the Word of God. Mr. Locke often mentions, continues the author, in his letters, several editions which Mr. Limborch had prepared and promised to transmit to him, that he might insert them in their proper places in the margin. I know not whether he ever had the pleasure of seeing them, Tis certain the public had never hitherto been favoured with them. When I first began my translation of the history, the late ingenious Anthony Collins, ESQ, informed me that he had some MS papers of Mr. Limborch relating to it, and generously sent them to me for my perusal. After this, I was informed by a worthy friend that there was a gentleman in Holland who had a large number of corrections and additions and, upon my application to him, be very kind, he very kindly ordered them to be transcribed out of the copy of Mr. Limborch's kept by him, which he had corrected and enlarged with his own hand, and transmitted them to me from The Hague. His name is Francis Limborch a worthy relation of the learned authors, to whom I take this opportunity of returning my sincere thanks for so, uh, for so valuable a present. We are speaking about Francis A. Limborch. He was a family relation to the author. The reader will find them included within these hooks, as you can see, these square hooks. So every time we read these square hooks within this book, this comes from additional transcribed notes by the author from Mr. Limbosch to adding into the original book. I have added also a few marginal notes to explain some of the terms made use of and to confirm the history in itself, uh, the history itself. As to the introduction, I thought it necessary to trace the history of persecution from its first beginnings, and thus to connect it with the account of the Inquisition. Though it be long, it might have been greatly enlarged, especially with several remarkable instances of it among the pagans, amongst the pagans. I cannot help inserting here one very extraordinary passage from Livy. The Roman historian thought it, to be, thought it be a little out of its place. He tells us, quote, that such a foreign religion spread itself over the city that either men or the gods seemed entirely changed that the Roman rites were not only forsaken in private and within the houses, but that even publicly in the Forum and Capitol great numbers of women flocked together, who neither sacrificed nor prayed to the gods, 
according to the manner of their ancestors. This first excited the private indignation of good men, till at length it reached the fathers and became public complaint. The Senate greatly blamed the Adels and capital triumvirs that they did not prohibit them, that they did not prohibit them, and when they endeavored to drive away the multitude from the form and to throw down the things they had provided to performing their f sacred rites, they were like to be torn in pieces. And when the evil grew so great, too great to be cured by inferior magistrates, the Senate ordered M. Attilius, the praetor of the city, to prevent the people's using these religions. Unquote. So we are speaking here of the early introduction of Christendom into Rome. We are speaking of that here how Rome reacted at the time when Paul was teaching to the Romans. Bringing a new religion. Following other gods than the gods of Romanism. He accordingly published this decree of the Senate that whoever had any fortune telling books or prayers or ceremonies about sacrifices written down, they would bring all such books and writings to him before the calends of April and that no one should use any new foreign rite of sacrificing in any public or sacred place. Now, <laughs> let me just go into this little part you can read here, before the calends of April. Why does he send a deadline before the calends of April? Because in that time, New Year was April. That was the start of the New Year, as it was in the Bible. In the Bible, New Year doesn't start in the dead of winter, the 1st of January, but in April, the month of Abib, the first month of the year, which the Jews celebrated with the Passover, when Jesus went to the cross. So before the calends of April, because that is the start of the new year. Messinas, a billionaire, trillionaire at that time, a very, very, very rich person at the time of the ancient pagan Rome, Messinas, in his advice to Augustus, says to him, quote, perform divine worship in all things exactly according to the custom of your ancestors and compel others to do so also. Uh, what did he just say? <laughs> Shall we read that again? Messina says to Augustus, perform divine worship in all things exactly according to the custom of your ancestors and compel others to do so also. What did the Jews do at the time when Jesus came? They worshipped according to their traditions and their father's traditions and not according to the word of God, the Bible. And here you have the exact same thing. Worshipping exactly according to the customs of your ancestors, of dead people and compel others to do also, not leaving the way of that belief system. Interesting, right? What Messinas wrote to Augustus here? And as to those who make any innovations in religion, hate and punish them, and that not only for the fake sake of the gods, but because those who introduce new deities excite others to make changes in civil affairs. Hence, conspiracies, seditions and riots, things very dangerous to government. Accordingly, Suetonius, in his life of, his prince, of, this, pri uh, of this prince, gives him this character. Quote, 
that though he religiously observe the ancient prescribed ceremonies, yet be contempt all other foreign ones, and commanded Caius, for that passing by Judea, he would not pay his devotions at Jerusalem. Unquote. He also, as the same author tells us, quote, made a law very much resembling all test act, uh, all test act by which he commanded that before any of the senators should take their places in council, they should offer frankincense and wine upon the altar of that god in whose temple they met. These and other passages that may be mentioned abundantly prove that the heathens as much in principle and as really in practice persecutors uh, and as really in, in practice persecutors as the Christians, and it is therefore very unfair and unreasonable to make it an objection against Christianity that so many of the professors of it have in all ages given into these ungodly and wicked measures. If it proves anything, it will prove as much against natural reason and religion as it does against, religion, uh, against the religion of Jesus. And if the vices of men who have had no other guide but the former prove nothing against the sufficiency and goodness of them, Christians also may be very wicked men, and yet the religion they profess be a very excellent and divine one. If any should ask why I trouble the world with the accounts of the persecutions that Christians have raised against each other at this time, now that the clergy of the all denominations seem to be entering into more moderate measures, I answer to give the little assistance I am able toward promoting a truly Catholic and charitable disposition. There being, as I apprehend, no way so proper to ex uh, to expose the doctrine and practice of persecution as by a fair representation of the unspeakable mischiefs that have been accounted by it, nor any other method so likely to render it universal abhorrence of mankind as to let them see, by past examples, what miseries they must expect if God should ever, for our sins, subject us against to the yoke of ecclesiastical power, which, wherever it is not kept under strict restraints, will usurp upon the authority and dignity of princes, and trample under foot all the civil and religious liberties of mankind. It is therefore highly incumbent upon all persons in their several stations, tis what the gentlemen of England, who, were, who are born to estates and honours, and knew the true value of liberty and property are more especially concerned and to do all that they can do to prevent the encroachments and gradual increases of spiritual tyranny. It being so much easy to do this, it, uh, sorry, it being much more easy to do this than to free themselves from it when once they have tamely submitted to the usurpations of it. If the persecuting spirit declines, it is far from being wholly extinguished. This is a very important. If the persecuting spirit declines, it is far from being wholly extinguished. The time that we live in today, we don't even understand the persecuting spirit anymore, because we are living in a world where religion does not play a role anymore, because we are being raised without any official religion. We are all made Catholic through the civil law, and we don't understand it. And if we don't have the luck to grow up with parents who give us the Bible and teach us all things from the spirit of truth from the beginning of our life, we are ignorant to the persecuting spirit that is never being wholly extinguished. I told you, it is not called the Inquisition anymore today, it is called the Congregation of the Faith, but it is still the same office. It is still led by the same persecuting spirit. It is still Satan who seeks to 
persecute and to extirpate the spirit of Jesus Christ in this world. The Holy Spirit that Jesus sent when he went up to the Father in heaven. The Comforter who will stay with us until the end of time. And the time is only ending when Jesus Christ comes back. If the persecuting spirits decline, it is far from being wholly extinguished. Do not think that the persecuting spirit is over. It's not. The claims of the church that now lay dormant want nothing but a fair opportunity to revise. And for the truth of this, I appeal to the late famous controversy about church power and authority. May God Almighty of his infinite mercy inspire all ranks and degrees of men with such a love to liberty and with such a sense of the greatness of their privilege in being free as to their conscience, free as to their religion, their persons and estates and shall secure us from all attempts to deprive us of it or at least as shall render all such attempts from warm defining bigots wholly ineffectual. Tis indeed impossible to present all abuses of liberty. But these are infinitely more tolerable than the evils that must necessarily flow from ecclesiastical tyranny, which is destructive to knowledge, which is destructive to learning, destructive to piety and virtue, and everything that is dear and valuable to men and Christians. Even these abuses of liberty have rendered many of the clergy of the Church of England immortal by their excellent defences of the Christian religion, and I persuade myself that their lordships of London, Durham, Lichfield and Coventry had rather be remembered and known to prosperity by pastoral letters, defences of Christianity and vindications of Christ's miracles than by the riggedness uh, and cruel zeal for uniformity in opinions and lifeless ceremonies by which many of their predecessors have left an indeliable stain on their names and memories. May they go on thus to adorn their episcopal character and by being examples of Christian piety, moderation and forbearance influence the inferior clergy to, uh, to imitate them. How is that? May they go on thus to adorn their episcopal character and by, be, and by being examples of Christian piety, moderation and forbearance influence the inferior clergy to imitate them. What does Rome teach? The clergy is superior to us, not inferior. But the clergy is betrayed especially the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, who have never read the Bible but read the Catechism. I have nothing more to add but to desire the reader to overlook any lesser faults that may have escaped me in the introduction or translation and to ask my subscriber's pardon for the long delay of this work. The ill state of my health for many months past and my constant engagements in life will be allowed as some excuse by all equitable persons. As to those who can make me no allowance, all I can say to them is that as this is the first book that I have published by subscription, so, according to my present judgment, it will be the last. Such as it is, if it, <clears throat> if it will do any good, I shall be thankful to God and not repent my own labor. Signed from Samuel Chandler. The introduction, the preface of the book, History of the Inquisition from Limborch. Signed, London, September 8th, 1732. And this brings us to the next part of the book. Of course, list of subscribers who paid for receiving this book, as you can see here on your screen. And we, of course, do not go through that. 
But then we start actually with the book in the next reading, the introduction, being the history of persecution. I will of course not start this now because I have come to almost an hour of reading, but I want to really, really, really know your comments. I really want to know if you are interested in following me reading this book. And if you do, then I will go on and read the rest of the 726 pages of this book also. Up to now, to this moment, I thank you all for watching, for listening and for commenting. Please. And may the Holy Spirit keep you. May God keep you and guide you in His ways. May God bless you, my brethren. Until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.